I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's February 6th, and we have a lot to talk about. Experts estimate that half of all the people living with MS who were employed at the time of their diagnosis stop working within five years of that diagnosis. In an age when having a two-income household is a necessity for many families, and just having regular income is a requirement if you happen to be a one-person household, That loss of income that results from MS disability progression is one more side effect of MS for which there doesn't seem to be any easy treatment. When people across the United States find themselves unable to continue working due to disability, they turn to Social Security Disability Insurance. And when they do, many are surprised to find the long, winding, and sometimes confusing road that lies ahead. Joining me to make sense of the process and talk about how you should be thinking about the process of applying for Social Security Disability Insurance, starting with why the time you leave the workforce is not the time to start thinking about it, is attorney Jamie Hall. Jamie specializes in Social Security Disability and Long-Term Disability Law, and he's the guy who literally wrote the book on applying for Social Security Disability Insurance or the National MS Society. But before we get to my conversation with Jamie Hall, there are a few other things that you should know about. The National MS Society has announced that Professor Sergio Baranzini is this year's recipient of the Baranzic Prize for Innovation in MS Research. Professor Baranzini is a geneticist, neuroimmunologist, and data scientist at the University of California, San Francisco, and he's being honored for his pioneering efforts to integrate huge pools of information in order to identify and understand the complex mechanisms that cause MS and to develop more precise approaches to stop MS and end MS by preventing MS. Professor Baranzini is a leading authority among a new generation of scientists studying MS who are using what's referred to as big data. That's massive amounts of data being generated by advanced technologies to reveal complex factors that are driving the disease. Among his many significant accomplishments, Professor Baranzini established the International MS Microbiome Study, a consortium of investigators in the field of MS and the microbiome to discover the role that gut bacteria play in the triggering, progression, and response to treatment for people with MS. They've enrolled more than 2,000 participants, making this the largest microbiome study in MS and any other autoimmune condition. Analyzing the data from this study, investigators are starting to see emerging patterns of specific bacteria that may trigger or perpetuate disease, as well as bacteria with potential beneficial properties. This work can potentially lead to developing probiotics or using diet to rebalance the gut microbiome to improve an individual's MS disease course. Another project that certainly merits mentioning is Professor Baranzini's decade-long work in SPOKE. That's S-P-O-K-E, and SPOKE is an acronym for Scalable Precision Medicine Open Knowledge Engine. And this ambitious project involves creating a massive knowledge graph database that holds the entire body of biomedical information that's been established over the past 50 years of research and medical practice. In one application, SPOKE can be integrated with extremely large numbers of medical records and using artificial intelligence discover patterns that could detect potential signs of MS years before they could be detected through clinical diagnosis. This application holds a promise of delivering new therapies, the implementation of precision medicine in diagnosing MS, and possible strategies to prevent MS. 
Last year, Professor Baranzini collaborated with Professor Stephen Saucer at Cambridge University in publishing a landmark paper on the largest study ever to understand the genetic basis of MS progression. This study of more than 20,000 people with MS identified gene variants that were linked to faster progression. The study offers new clues for developing therapies to stop MS and provides evidence for recommending actions to be taken that may reduce disease progression. I could fill up multiple episodes of this podcast detailing Professor Baranzini's work, but I hope I've shared enough for you to appreciate the scope of his accomplishments. Now, I can best define the depth of Professor Baranzini's accomplishments by sharing that I can remember sitting at an International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Congress in 2016, listening to Professor Baranzini explain to a packed ballroom how big data was going to fundamentally change scientific discovery. Since then, his contributions to our understanding of some of the complex factors that drive MS continue to remind us about how right he was. I'm looking forward to connecting with Professor Baranzini at the end of this month at the 2024 Actrums Forum, where he'll deliver the Baranzic Prize Lecture. Actrums is an acronym for the America's Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis, and the theme of this year's Actrums Forum is Breaking Barriers in MS. As a quick review of what the Baranzic Prize is all about, the Baranzic Prize for Innovation in MS Research recognizes exceptional innovation and originality in scientific research relevant to multiple sclerosis, with emphasis on impact and potential of the research to lead to pathways for the treatment and cure for MS, along with scientific accomplishments that merit recognition as a future leader in MS research. The International Prize is made possible through the generosity of the Charles and Marjorie Baranzic Foundation, and the prize is administered by the National MS Society. You already know that multiple sclerosis is a disease of the central nervous system, and you already know that the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and spinal cord. But did you know that the disease-modifying therapies that you take for MS don't actually travel to the central nervous system? Even those high-efficacy B-cell-depleting DMTs only deplete the B-cells in your bloodstream. They can't get to the B-cells in your central nervous system because your central nervous system is surrounded by a cellular structure that's specifically designed to protect your brain and spinal cord from toxins and other harmful substances. This structure is called the blood-brain barrier, and the blood-brain barrier does such a good job of protecting the central nervous system that virtually all large molecule drugs and about 98% of the small molecule drugs in the human bloodstream are unable to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. But today, scientists have never been closer to identifying ways to successfully get treatments through the blood-brain barrier and into the central nervous system. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania have created a simple model of the blood-brain barrier in their lab, and they've been testing the best ways to transport drugs into the central nervous system. They're finding success delivering therapies in fat-soluble packages called lipid nanoparticles, which can pass through the blood-brain barrier carrying proteins, antibodies, or messenger RNA. Now, if this description sounds a little familiar, it's the same packaging that allows the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine to enter the body's cells. Many experts believe that mRNA therapies can be especially effective in treating neurological diseases, but in order to do their work, they have to reach their target. Scientists have observed that while lipid nanoparticles manage to cross the blood-brain barrier, not all the medicine they carry makes it into brain cells. So next steps in this work will involve identifying the best drug candidates for this novel method of crossing the blood-brain barrier. We'll be hearing more about disease-modifying therapies that are in clinical trials right now that have shown success in penetrating the blood-brain barrier as well as other mRNA therapies to treat MS that are also currently in development. If you'd like to review the details of this research, 
You'll find a link in today's show notes. Last month, the FDA granted fast track designation to KYV101, an investigational cell therapy for treatment resistant progressive MS being developed by biopharmaceutical company Kyverna Therapeutics. This fast track designation is designed to accelerate the development of therapies that address the unmet medical needs of people with serious or life threatening conditions. KYV-101 is a type of immunotherapy called a CAR-T therapy, which is already used to treat a variety of different cancers. Now, in CAR-T therapy, blood is taken from the patient much as you would facilitate a blood donation. This blood is sent to a lab where the white blood cells or T cells are separated out and reprogrammed to carry a receptor designed to fight a particular condition. This receptor is known as a chimeric antigen receptor. Now, that's a lot to say, so it's referred to by its acronym, CAR, or CAR. Over the course of several weeks in the lab, these fortified T cells multiply until there are millions of them, and then they are reintroduced to the patient through an intravenous infusion. In the case of KYV-101, the CAR receptor is designed to recognize a specific protein on the surface of B cells, called CD19. This protein is thought to be active in MS, and the CAR T cells target and eliminate these B cells. And the theory behind this therapy is that a single treatment of KYV-101 will provide sustained control of their MS for people living with progressive MS. The FDA's fast-track designation was announced just a couple of weeks after it had given Kyverna Therapeutics approval for a Phase two clinical trial that will recruit 12 people living with either primary progressive or secondary progressive MS who have not experienced a relapse or active inflammatory lesions over the past two years and aren't responding to currently available treatments. While we're talking about the FDA's fast-track designation, I should also mention that Kyverna Therapeutics, the company behind KYV101, well, they've done some fast-tracking of their own. Last week, they announced that they've developed a method for producing CAR T-cells in just three days, starting with a simple blood draw, instead of the several weeks it has traditionally taken for this process to be completed. This new process involves a simple blood draw and increases treatment accessibility while reducing costs, all things that will certainly improve the patient experience. We'll keep you updated on KYV 101 as the Phase 2 clinical trial moves forward. Previous research has shown that in countries with private health insurance, like the United States, college-educated people living with MS are more likely to be on a disease-modifying therapy. But because people with a college education also tend to earn more money than those without a college degree, it hasn't been possible to determine whether this choice to be on a DMT is a function of education or income. That's what makes the recently published results of a similar study from the UK particularly interesting. The UK has a publicly funded health insurance system, so income isn't considered a factor in analyzing someone's health care choices. And when it comes to making a choice of being on disease-modifying therapy or not, university-educated people living with MS in the UK are also more likely to be on a DMT. In this study, researchers used information from the UK MS Register and identified data from more than 6,300 people with MS. Just under half of these people had a university education, and nearly two-thirds of those people with a university education were on a disease-modifying therapy. Of the people who didn't have a university education, only 53% were on a DMT. In this study, people with the university education were also more likely to be on a high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy. So the next question for researchers to riddle out is, what is it about having a college education itself that makes someone with MS more likely to be on a disease-modifying therapy, and how can that social inequity be offset? 
If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. While we're on the subject of healthcare inequities, let's talk about results from a recently published study from the Cleveland Clinic's Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis that revealed that geographical proximity to neurologists and MS care centers is lower for people living in rural areas of the United States, as well as areas with higher proportions of Hispanic individuals, uninsured people, and people who are living with disabilities. Now, there's a shortage of neurologists and MS care centers in the United States, but the prevalence of neurology practices and MS comprehensive care centers in different regions of the country varies dramatically. It's logical that proximity to care influences access to care. Everyone enjoys convenience. And when you're taking three different buses to get to your neurology appointment, getting to that appointment becomes a hardship. In this study, the research team used data from a number of publicly available sources, including the U.S. Census Bureau, to identify neurologists and MS care centers within individual census tracts. Across the study area, researchers identified 34,143 neurology practice centers and 185 MS centers, with a total of 15,113 neurologists between the two. Based on the almost 1 million people living with MS in the United States, if access was equitable, each MS center would be responsible for treating between 2,300 and 5,100 patients, depending on their geographic region. Of the 70,858 census tracts across the U.S. that were analyzed, the research team found that about 97% of these tracts were within 60 miles of a neurology practice. But when they looked for MS care centers, about 25% of the census tracts had no MS care centers within 60 miles. The study showed that access to neurological care was lower in rural areas and smaller cities than it was in major metropolitan areas. And geographic access to care was also lower in areas with a higher proportion of Hispanic residents, a higher proportion of males, uninsured individuals, and people with vision, hearing, or walking impairment. Geographic access to neurological care was better in areas with a higher proportion of black residents and older residents, as well as those with college degrees, computers, cognitive difficulties, limited English proficiency, and no personal transportation like a car. Now, it's just my own observation, but it's worth noting that many of the best MS comprehensive care centers, like the Cleveland Clinic, are located in inner-city neighborhoods. And while the residents of those communities may in fact have geographic proximity to these MS centers, I think it would be interesting to investigate whether they have the same access as other populations who may be located in the city's suburbs or exurbs. And the answer to that question may have less to do with geography and more to do with the social determinants of health. The study's research team pointed out that expanding other healthcare delivery options, like telemedicine, would be a step toward offsetting the geographic inequities identified in this study. If you'd like to review the details of the study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. When someone's MS progresses to the point when they can no longer remain at their job, they may quickly discover that their access to Social Security disability benefits is governed by how well they understand the process of applying. That process is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. And joining me in a moment with some insights that will put you in better position to successfully cross the finish line in that particular race is Social Security disability insurance expert, Attorney Jamie Hall. The Social Security Administration recognizes MS as a chronic illness or impairment that can cause disability severe enough to prevent an individual from working. If you're living with multiple sclerosis and you're unable to work due to an MS related disability or other condition, you may be entitled to receive Social Security disability insurance commonly referred to as SSDI. 
But a quick scan of literally dozens of social media posts underscores the reality that for many people living with MS, understanding the process and applying for SSDI benefits uh, can be a confusing and stressful ordeal. Returning to the podcast to help unravel the mysteries and increase the odds of success if and when you find yourself applying for Social Security Disability Insurance is attorney Jamie Hall. Jamie specializes in Social Security Disability and Long-Term Disability Law. Welcome back to the podcast, Jamie. Thank you, John, for having me back on Real Talk MS. Pleasure to be here today. I always like to get our definitions out of the way first. So can you explain what SSDI is and how it can benefit someone who's living with MS? Yeah, John. So SSDI, as you said earlier, is Social Security Disability Insurance. And people say, I'm on disability. Nine times out of 10, that's what they mean in everything. Uh, when you look at your pay stubs and you see the Social Security portion taken out in taxes, that's to pay in part for the SSDI program. And what you're paying for there is coverage in case something happens, preventing you from working. And that coverage includes both a cash benefit and Medicare eligibility, both of which are incredibly important in general, but especially for the MS community with the number of providers that they see for their condition. Does MS automatically qualify someone to receive SSDI benefits? It does not, John. Uh, We have a saying in my office that diagnosis is not disability. And as many of your listeners know, a person can work for a long time with an MS diagnosis before having to leave work. And one of the goals of providers out there and physical therapists and medication companies is to give a person as much time to work as possible before disability ensues. So Social Security looks at disability and the inability to work, not simply the diagnosis. Why do you suppose the process of applying for SSDI benefits feels like it's stacked against the person applying? In part because people just aren't familiar with the system. Um, And anything you're not familiar with can be scary. Uh, I I, I say oftentimes for me, you know, trying to do an oil change can be scary because I don't do it very often. You know, same thing with this. It's just unusual and different for them. There's also the, the problematic thing is if you look online or on a message board, the person who was denied will talk a lot more than the people who were approved. Um, we find oftentimes the process, the system gets to the right conclusion. It just may take time and people have to be patient and use appeals as need be. Well, can you take us through the process of applying for SSDI benefits How does someone living with MS prove that their MS symptoms are making it impossible for them to work? John, there's really two components you're looking at for a disability claim. Uh, One part's what we call subjective complaints. And that's what you tell your doctor and tell the judge you're feeling. You describe the fatigue you have and the numbness in your hands and the forgetfulness and everything. The other half is the objective part. And that's what's really important in a disability claim to give weight to the claim. And that's the testing the doctors do when they assess your strength and your hand function, and they watch you walk for balance issues, maybe do a memory test on you. That objective testing is incredibly important to show more specifically what your limitations are. And if you can have things like neuropsychological evaluations or functional capacity testing, those those tests are really, really important to document what's going on and give more weight to what you're telling the judge you're feeling. How long does the approval process usually take from the time someone applies to the time they're actually approved? It varies significantly by claim and by region. Uh, So in most areas, claims at the initial level are decided in about five months. So you can get approval within five months in most areas. If you're denied, you go to a hearing. And in most areas, a hearing happens within 18 months of when you apply. However, There are some areas of the country that are outliers. Florida, Texas, Delaware come to mind immediately. In those areas, that initial period is not five months. It's more like 12 months or more. And the hearing process is longer to get through as well. So you want to be prepared for an extended disability claim process before money moves to you. In this scenario, again, in short, could be as quick as five months could be significantly longer, and you and those around you should be prepared for that kind of weight and that kind of fight. 
while we're talking about that initial period uh, of application, maybe you can address, uh, I guess, what, what I'll call an, an online urban legend, but you see it often, and that is that the Social Security Administration automatically rejects first-time applications. It, it's false. I can tell you from hundreds of examples, uh, it's not accurate. But I can tell you that people who are denied tend to be more vocal about it online. We all know those kinds of things that if a negative result is always more vocal. And also the negative results at the initial level can be more jarring. I had a client come to me who was literally using a mechanized wheelchair who had MS, was denied at the initial level. We had to ever go to a hearing. And the judge saw her come in and essentially apologized for having brought her through the process. So failures like that in the system will stick in our head much more strongly than her being approved at the initial level. But it's another way to say, if you're denied at the initial level, appeal that decision. That's why appeals are there. And typically, if you build a good claim and it's justified, we can get the right result given enough time. Once someone is approved to receive SSDI benefits, how much can they expect to receive and how often will they receive payments? Individuals are typically paid once per month, just like an employment check would be issued. Uh, And those checks do have withdrawals from them, such as tax withholding and things of that nature. As far as the calculation of benefits goes, it's a little bit different process there. They look at the highest number of years earnings you've had in your lifetime. So for instance, if you're 60, they may look at your highest 30 years of earnings in your lifetime, run that through a rubric they have, and it puts out a number of what your benefit would be. What's important there is they're not penalizing you if the last couple of years due to your MS, you haven't made as much money as you made at your peak. So that number does vary based upon your earnings history. Typically, claimants get a benefit of between $1,500 and $3,500 per month. You can confirm that either by calling Social Security and asking them that question or going online to ssa.gov as in socialsecurityadministration.gov, and looking up your disability benefit amount. Someone may come to the conclusion that it's time for them to leave the workforce, but they need that regular income until they start receiving their SSDI benefits. So can that person apply for SSDI benefits while they're still employed? This is one of the greatest challenges that my clients have, is how do you get past the 5 to 18 months from application to decision, not having an income. A person who's working full-time, by definition, is not disabled and cannot qualify for benefits during that time period. Uh, That person could work part-time if they have a position that lets them do that. We typically recommend that you stay below 20 hours a week, that you stay below $900 per month on income, and also that you do a job consistent with disability, so not running a jackhammer but a person will see a significant loss of income while awaiting the decision. And one of the things I say there is this is a rainy day when you're waiting for a disability decision. So those rainy day funds and war chests that you've built, this is the time to tap into them to get across that period of time. It's also why it's so important to plan ahead as a, an MS patient, knowing you may be going through this claim process and save accordingly. In addition to SSDI, The Social Security Agency also pays Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, benefits. Now, these SSI benefits are different from SSDI benefits, but the disability determination is the same for both. So can you walk us through the difference between SSDI and SSI? Yeah, I'll I'll give you the short version here, John, because you could write a book on the differences here if you wanted to. And you're correct. The medical assessment they do is exactly the same for figuring out whether a person qualifies for disability. So the way they look at your symptoms, your diagnosis are exactly the same. What's different is the way they look at your work history and your income. So we talked about SSDI. The I stands for insurance. And you buy into the insurance program through your past work, through those taxes that you pay. So to qualify for SSDI, you have to have sufficient lifetime and recent work history to qualify. SSDI does not care how much money you have saved up. If your great aunt passed away and left you a million dollars, it's irrelevant here because you've paid into the insurance program. 
SSI is somewhat the opposite. SSI does not care if you've worked one hour in your entire life. SSI simply cares, do you qualify medically? And if so, do you have any assets to rely upon going forward? Because SSI, supplemental security income, is a a benefit of last resort here. So if you have family who is working and bringing in money, it may prevent you from qualifying. If you have benefits from another source or savings from another source, it may also prevent you from qualifying. So again, the two programs, one is insurance for people who have worked. The other is a benefit of last resort for those who have nothing else to fall back on financially. So would there be a situation where someone might apply or be approved for both SSDI and SSI benefits at the same time? There are limited scenarios where that could occur. It's typically for a person with a work history that's very limited but just enough to qualify for SSDI. And they may perhaps get a benefit instead of the, the 1500 to 3500 I mentioned earlier of, say, $300 a month from SSDI. In that scenario, that's not enough money to preclude you from also qualifying for SSI. So you may get benefits under both programs to try to max out what you can get there and everything. So typically, if that's the case, there is a very limited work history and a very modest benefit you're getting from SSDI, where SSI will help fill some of the gap for you. When is it time for someone to talk with an attorney about applying for SSDI benefits? You could ask 100 attorneys and get 100 answers on this one here. Uh, So John, I think that your listeners are already ahead of the game here by getting information today. Because I tell individuals the best time to start planning for this is not the day you leave work. It's a year or two years before. So we talked about that war chest earlier. You have to be able to build financially, emotionally, you and your family team for the rough process you're going to go through. So when you think this may be coming on the pike, have an initial understanding of what your benefit would be and what the process is like, how long it takes. The stuff we've talked about today makes a huge difference in planning. As far as actually talking with an attorney or someone about starting the process, I'd recommend when you see that disability is imminent that you see that you're leaving work, not at some point, but a month from now, two months from now. It's good to speak with counsel about how to leave work. So we can talk with the individual about talking with their neurologist, what the, how to educate the neurologist on them leaving work, and how to talk to the physical therapist, whatever it may be, and frankly, how to best leave the employer. Those are all things we can help a person do more smoothly, and we as attorneys can provide greater value to the individual and make their life easier as they enter this process. And are there other professionals someone should consider working through the SSDI application process with? Individuals should use anyone they can who can assist them in the claim process here. Uh, This includes social workers, uh, such as at your neurologist office. Social workers are a bastion of knowledge, and they're very adept at knowing different things they can assist with and different avenues they can help. So those are great individuals there. Uh, We also recommend speaking with family members or trusted individuals who can help you with the claim itself and help you fill out documentation itself or help with things you need to remember and look up is really helpful too. Those are two of the main sources we look at as far as assistance goes early in the process there. Once SSDI benefits have been approved, can they be discontinued? They can, but it's rarely the case. Uh, John, I've been doing this for probably about 15 years and half my clientele are MS patients. Uh, I can say today I've never once had an MS patient thrown off with very small exception. One is they went back to work, which is a success for everybody. Number two is that they simply didn't fill out the forms from the SSA asking for an update. What we see is the SSA typically looks to confirm that you're still treating and symptomatic. If that's the case and you respond to the SSA's application forms, they will keep you on benefits. And they only do these applications or these reviews every three to five years as well. So they're not done frequent. It's not overly burdensome. It's just kind of a fact check to make sure that there's still something going on there. Well, I just heard you mention that if someone goes back to work, which absolutely is a big win for everybody, at that point, they're not going to continue receiving SSDI benefits. What happens, let's uh, fast forward the calendar a little bit, and maybe, um, I don't know, six months goes by or a year, 
and uh, they, they find that their disability is caught up with them and they can't continue in that job. Do they begin the process again of applying for benefits? So it depends on that timeline. And you say six months to a year, and there's some very important numbers in there. So again, the system wants people to go back to work. They want you to find a job you can do, get back into the workforce, and get off of disability, which is really challenging. And we all know that, but some of us are lucky enough to do that. If you're looking at going back to work full time, you should let Social Security know. And they have a couple of programs out there called a a Ticket to Work program and things like that that let you sample employment without losing your access to disability. And in short, how that program works is you can go back to work full-time for up to nine months and see how your condition responds. If your condition responds well and you can continue doing that job, you simply keep working. And you don't get paid any benefits for that period, but you're back to work. So it's a win for everybody. If that person, however, realizes within those nine months that they can't continue working full time, they can simply stop working, let Social Security know, and Social Security will then turn the benefit back on, essentially. Now, it's really important to coordinate this with the SSA so they can make sure you're in the proper deadlines there. But in general, they want you to try to go back to work. And it's a really good program to let you sample return to work and see how your body responds. Another significant benefit of being approved for SSDI benefits is that you're automatically eligible for Medicare, regardless of your age. So when someone is approved to receive SSDI benefits, do they have to then apply for Medicare coverage or is that automatic? So it is automatic, but we want to add a little caveat here. There's a waiting period. So from when a person's disability began, Typically, when they leave work, Medicare coverage will not begin for 29 months after they left work. So if you go through the process really quickly and you're approved in five months, as we talked about earlier, one of the catches is you've got another two years to wait for Medicare to kick in. So again, from when you leave work, when your disability starts, you'll be Medicare eligible 29 months later if you're approved for benefits. Well, Jamie Hall, thank you for your career-long effort to helping people who most need help in securing some level of financial stability when they see so many other things in their lives drastically changing. And thanks so much for talking with me today. John, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. As I mentioned when I introduced him, Jamie has written the book on applying for SSDI benefits, and you can download that no-cost guide from the National MS Society's website. You'll find that link in today's show notes. And that's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 336. You'll find that link in today's show notes so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.